today our scripture reading from the Revised Common Lectionary that unites us with all those in Christian worship worldwide. I have selected the reading from the Psalm 51. I'm using the paraphrase known as the message. It's sometimes in its contemporary language and its contemporary word images can give us a new look at the scriptures. Our psalm today speaks of the salvation, the cleansing power that spirit has in our life. Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me and I'll have a snow white life. Tune me in to foot-tapping songs. Set these once broken bones to dancing. Don't look too close for blemishes. Give me a clean bill of health. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week, a new beginning from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from gray exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. Give me a job teaching, excuse me, give me a job teaching rebels your ways so the lost can find their way home. Commute my death sentence, God, my salvation, God, and I'll sing anthems to your life-giving ways. Unbutton my lips, dear God, and I'll let loose with your praise. So we give thanks for these inspired words from the Psalms. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown You know, (laughs) it was almost... 50 years ago when I was called as a child to stand up and sing that in church. The music director was having a little fun with me because in 1967 I performed in Kansas City's Lyric Opera Company and she knew that. And so when I appeared at church she thought it might be fun to say, well, let's have James, now that he's been in the opera, come up and sing. And she chose the old rugged cross, a song that I knew well from my upbringing in the Baptist church. And those old songs, several of which we've had this morning, Sweet Hour of Prayer, I Am the Way, the Truth, and Others, speak to us of fundamentals of the Christian concept of salvation. Now, some of us have come to unity by many different paths. Some of us have come to unity from a traditional denomination. Some of us have come from no religious background. Some of us come loving our history in the church, and others have been challenged by it. So in the coming weeks, 
we are going to look first in September at three fundamental concepts in the Christian tradition. Today, salvation. Next week, what is meant by incarnation. And then in the third week, what is meant by baptism. Then in October, I'm going to switch things around and we're going to look at fundamental unity teachings. What unity has to say about prosperity, health, positive thinking, religion and spirituality, and finally, what does unity teach about the Bible? It was only this week on Facebook, there's a special private part of Facebook that's for unity ministers to get together and talk. And one woman said from another part of the country, she was, is a unity minister, and she wanted to join the um, ecumenical council of churches in her area. And so she applied. And as often the case, many people who are not familiar with our unity based in Christian tradition confuse it because our name sounds so familiar or so similar to the Unitarian Church. And so she was told in her community that she could not join because they did not accept Unitarians nor Jews in their council of churches. Well, she was asking her other unity ministers if anyone else had had trouble in their community belonging to the council of churches. Well, it is through, I'm afraid, ignorance or lack of understanding that unity has been accused of many things. Over the years, I've heard that we don't teach the Bible. We don't believe in it. We don't believe in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in being saved. So I thought it might be good to look at this concept to begin with of salvation. Sometimes unity people don't know what to say in their communities when someone approaches them and says, Connie, are you saved? Well, in our unity understanding, we are saved. We do have a concept of salvation, but sometimes it's not quite expressed in exactly the same way as it can be in traditional churches. In the traditional church, salvation as a word means wholeness. Wholeness. It means to be right with God, to be aligned with our God and with our Creator. Salvation is many times associated with classic quotations from the Scripture, of course, from the New Testament or Christian Scripture, and usually from the Gospels, the story of Jesus Christ's life walking this earth. And some of those phrases, not fully understood in their very depth and essence, we can trip over the words and sometimes become not only confused, but lost. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father. By the suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are saved if we believe and confess this truth. Or as I learned growing up in the church, we are washed and made whole and right with God by the blood shed by Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, I spent many years at the Founders Church, 
the Unity Church in Kansas City, known as Unity Temple. And in that church, just off the lobby, is a painting or a print that our founders, Charles and Phil, uh, Myrtle Fillmore, bought about 1900. They put it in the very first Unity building that was erected in 1906. We have photographs. We know that it was in the lobby of that church. Later, it was moved to the temple on the plaza when that structure was built. It's a famous depiction of Jesus Christ by the artist Hoffman. He's giving a blessing gesture. But at the bottom of the picture is a scripture quote. What's interesting, it is in German. But there are people that come into the church and they know German. And one time I had a man quite angry. I was giving a tour to a group at the temple. And he pointed and he said, do you know what that means in German? And I said, well, yes, I, I do. Why, that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He said that's wholly inappropriate in a unity church to say that only Jesus can lead those to a salvation or to a place of rightness with the Father. Well, I didn't want to harshly contradict him, but I did say, well, our founders often spoke of that scripture and their understanding was that was the Christ speaking through the human being, Jesus. So it is that perfect divine presence within us that we call the indwelling Christ that is declaring, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. That is, except through this inner awareness. This inner truth is found in the depth of our souls. The Fillmores called it our divine inheritance, our divine birthright, because we are God's creation. Or as the psalm said when it mentioned Genesis, we remember the creation story in Genesis, that we are created in the image and likeness of our creator. A connection. More than a connection. We are God's children. Now salvation this wholeness as defined in Unity's Revealing Word, one of our early study documents prepared in the 1920s, most of it written by Charles Fillmore, although there were some other editors involved. It defines salvation as the restitution of man to his spiritual birthright, regaining conscious possession of his God-given attributes. It comes as the result of redemption, the change from error to righteousness or true thought. Salvation comes to man as a free gift from God. It embodies a knowledge of God that frees one from all limitations and points the way by which mind and body may be lifted up to the spiritual place of consciousness. Ah, here's the catch. The belief that Jesus, in an outer way, atoned for our sins is not true salvation. Salvation is based solely on an inner overcoming, a change in consciousness. It is a cleansing of the mind through Christ from all thoughts of evil or negativity. Now, we have to recall a little point of our history as a Unity family. If we go back to the early Unity work in Kansas City, we will find, and I have talked to many of these people, aren't too many still around 
that knew the Fillmores back in the early days. But those that did would tell me, well, you know, I went to my traditional church and then I also went to unity. Charles Fillmore spoke of unity as a school or a supplement. It was a place where Christians of many denominations could come and unity would help them to go more deeply into the teachings of the church. Charles Fillmore thought it was most important that a unity student, student, hear that, not a member, but a student, it implies education or growth or learning, that it was very important that individuals understood the Christian principles. Charles said unity does not deny or is not in disagreement with any of the Christian teachings. It's just that we endeavor to go more deeply into them, to understand their essence. Now, I used to argue sometimes when I was in unity ministerial training with some of my classmates. We'd get into a discussion, and those of us that came from a very traditional background, and we heard such statements as being washed in the blood of Christ, some of my classmates would get upset. Ooh, what an ugly, brutal, nasty image. The blood, like at a butcher's shop. But I said, well, that's a very materialistic way to look at it. Why not see it as a metaphor, as a symbol? For the blood throughout history has been seen as the essential life force of any living thing. So even in communion, when the Protestant and Catholic Church could not agree over what the actual elements of the blood and body of Christ or the wine and the bread, what they truly were, we could understand in unity that the blood was symbolic of the very life of Christ and the bread was symbolic of the very substance that stands under every blessing we have. And this is what we were celebrating in Christian communion. However, it's never that simple. And if you study unity teachings, and especially the writings of Charles Fillmore, Myrtle Fillmore I've always found, even though she was a Victorian teacher of her day, she could get more to the point. I guess I follow more in the tradition of Charles Fillmore. Let's see it from many, many different angles. But Charles had a conception of salvation that included both the traditional sense that our salvation comes from the deed of Jesus Christ the crucifixion and the resurrection. The Fillmores called it the great demonstration. That Jesus Christ laid down his life, gave up his life on the cross, and then was resurrected so that humanity could know that physical death that was up there just a moment ago Physical death is not the end. That there is a spiritual resurrection. As in this depiction of Christ arising from the tomb on the day of the resurrection. Charles Fillmore described atonement, another concept that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, humanity was atoned or brought back into right relationship with its God and Creator. They even used to play with the words 
and they take the word atonement, break it into its syllables, and pronounce it at one month. At one month. That's what atonement means, to be at one with God in unity with our Creator. He writes, atonement means the reconciliation between God and men through Christ. Jesus became the way by which all who accept him may pass over into the higher idea. We have atonement through him. The whole human race was caught in the meshes of its own thought and through drowsy ignorance would have remained there had not a break been made in the structure and the light of a higher way let in. And then this was one of the most powerful images. It's been published many times by Unity over the years, especially in the book Keep a True Lent. But it is a powerful image in which Charles Fillmore saw the particular historic deed of Jesus Christ in the death and the resurrection. And he attempted to understand it with this image. If you were held in the meshes of a great spider web and someone made a hole through which you could pass, you would go where the hole was and would make your escape that way. Jesus made this aperture, this opening, in the human race thought of death and thus threw open wide the door into the spiritual realm. For Charles Fillmore, this deed of 2,000 years ago, this deed of the Christ in Jesus made an opening for humanity for its further development as a great human family and for each and every individual. But Charles added another point and this is sometimes what we emphasize in unity to this day. That Jesus Christ made this opening, created this possibility for the human being to once again be right with God, to set aside all difficulties, all errors, all problems, all mistakes, and be brought back in perfect unity with our Creator. But whereas some, in a traditional sense, find this free gift of salvation a matter of faith, unity saw it as a matter of work, striving. That is, that we would each take up on ourselves this divine gift, this opportunity of seeing an eternal life beyond physical death. And then, whenever we are challenged in life by apparent endings, illness, death, disappointment, anything that comes to an end, we would have the opportunity to choose death or life. It would be up to us to look at perhaps the end of a career or that time of retirement in life and say, I don't choose to see an utter and complete end, a death. I see a new opening, a new possibility, a new opportunity 
This is a change of the phase in my life. On this historic date for our country, this September 11th, we can, thinking of our daily word today, which was appropriately remembrance, we can think of what happened in our great American family 15 years ago. I can remember it quite well because I was enrolled in Unity Ministerial Training at that time. And on that morning, we were in a nice peaceful prayer service when we were called out and told what had happened first in New York City and later in Washington. But salvation, this redeeming, restoring power, is something that we do not want to limit simply to our religion, our Christian teaching, or even our unity teaching. We want to go out and behold and support and take on this renewing, redeeming power. In New York City and in Washington and even the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, there were heroic human beings that took on the salvation power What do I mean by that? They set aside their own concerns of their own life and they reached out to those who were harmed, those who were suffering. They were those great heroes who reached out to save others. And so on this day of September 11th, I invite you to think about the saving, restoring, redeeming, renewing power. Yes, we teach it in our Christian tradition of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And knowing that, and striving to understand that truth, we are uplifted through our own healing, our own renewing. We can say to our friends and neighbors that ask us, yes, I am saved. The spirit that created me and brought me into being saves and sustains me. But in Unity's tradition, of practicing these spiritual principles, not just confessing them, not just holding them in our prayer and meditation time, but actually working them in our daily life. It's like the individual I heard many years ago that said, well, I don't think of unity so much as a church or a religion. It's more a way of life. That's the essence of it. Taking spiritual principle and, as the Fillmore said, demonstrating it. Putting it to work in our life. So for you, the conception of being saved or salvation as taught in the Christian tradition may be an exalted idea that you may or may not understand. But I am encouraging you to see the spiritual principle as something that you can work in your life. Whenever you face those endings of any kind, choose life as Jesus Christ did. See the new opening, the new opportunity, what can be the possibility before you. And also, as people of compassion and goodwill, be willing to reach that hero's hand out to someone who needs your assistance, who needs your help. 
No, it doesn't have to be that you run into a burning building and save the baby that we've heard so much in many stories and carry them out of the burning building. No, it may be someone that you meet here in Lori or Sunrise Beach who's dejected and down and have been very discouraged by life. And you reach out a hand of hope an acknowledgement that they're important, that they have something wonderful to give to the world, and maybe just a simple gesture of buying their cup of coffee, of not ignoring them but greeting them with a smile. That may be just enough to save their day, to turn their way around. So let us take a moment to turn now to a time of meditation, a time of prayer. And for today's meditation, I'm going to speak a translation of the Lord's Prayer. And the reason I'm doing so is Jesus offered in this perfect pattern of prayer Something very simple, but we have to look for it. In the Lord's Prayer, we are both told what God has freely given us. The divine gift. And then other lines of the prayer speak to us about what is ours to do. What is our responsibility in this world? to forgive others as we also have been forgiven. So the prayer in between the lines speaks to us as I've hoped to present salvation today. Yes, it begins as a free gift of God, an opportunity of renewal for us. But then we in turn have the responsibility of working with those spiritual principles and bringing them into expression in our life, in our relationships, in our whole world family. So let us turn our attention within, close your eyes if you choose. Father, you who were, are, and will be in the inmost being of all of us. May your name, your very nature, be glorified and praised. May your kingdom grow more expansive in our deeds and in the conducts of our lives. May we enact your will in our life as you, Father, have enshrined it in our inmost heart and soul. In overflowing abundance, you give us spiritual nourishment, the bread of life, through all changing conditions of our lives. Let our mercy toward others atone for the sins perpetuated upon our being. You do not allow the tempter to work in us beyond the capacity of our strength, for no temptation can prevail in your being, and the tempter is only appearance and delusion from which you will safely deliver us, Father, through the light of your knowledge. May your power and glory work in us through all the cycles of time.
And now as we've affirmed this perfect prayer of truth, of our true relationship with God, our Creator, and God's Christ, our guide, our sustainer, the one who walks with us through this life. guiding us with truth, wisdom, compassion. For this blessing we say, thanks be to God, thanks be to Christ. I invite you now to gently allow your awareness to return.